I'm delighted to have the honor of introducing Keith Donahue, author of The Stolen Child, Angels of Destruction, and Centuries of June. I first met Keith at last year's Gaithersburg Book Festival where uh, he came up to me when I was signing my book and he humbly introduced himself to me uh, as a writer and I said, well, what do you write? And he said, I, you know, very humbly, I write literary fiction. Um, and at the time I hadn't read any of his work so I just congratulated him on the upcoming release of Centuries of June uh, and he went on his way. And then I read Centuries of June. And to call Keith Donahue a writer of literary fiction is a little like saying that Julia Child knows a little bit about French cooking. Uh, this is technically true, but it really only scratches the surface. Centuries of June is absolutely delicious. It's a blend of absurdist humor and historical drama, and it's one of those books that every time I had to put it down, I could not stop thinking about it. Uh, and I devoured it, I think, in a day, which is my favorite way to, to read a book. The notoriously grumpy folks at Kirkus Reviews called Centuries of June a tour de force in its mastery of styles. Publishers Weekly called it greatly satisfying, and the Washington Post said, think Scheherazade by way of Tristram Shandy, by way of the sixth sense. Uh, Keith has a doctorate in English with a specialization in modern Irish literature. He lives in Maryland, and we are so lucky to have him here today. Please welcome Keith Donahue. Thank you, uh, Eleanor, for that introduction. Uh, you know, when they said that uh, Eleanor Brown would be introducing me, you know, that, that name is such a wonderful, there's such a wonderful sound to it. It's like a uh, Jane Austen kind of name, <laughs> Eleanor Brown. You're expecting some sort of reserved English woman <laughs> to, you know, introduce you. And then you have the, the bullient Eleanor Brown, the real deal. So thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about and that that actually leads me to to something that I, I do want to mention about judging people by their cover, the cover of their name or their or what they look like, or covers in general. Um, when I wrote Centuries of June, part of it is well, all of it is set in the house, in the bathroom of a house, an old house in Washington D.C. And the hero of the book goes back and forth between the bathroom and his bedroom. And in his bedroom, there happen to be eight women in his bed without a stitch on. Um, so I wrote this book, and then the, you, you go through the process of having the designers come up with a cover. And the designers came up with the cover. I don't know if you can all see that from way back there. Uh, this is sort of like church. Yeah, you can come up. Um, and they said, well, Keith, what do you think of this? And I said, oh, that's fine. That's fine by me. Uh, I've got no objection to this. So this is the cover of the book uh, that went out into the real world. And then I started thinking about it, uh, that how would that affect sales? You know, part of it is art, but a lot of it is you know, sales, unfortunately. So how would this affect sales? Would it help sales? Would it hurt sales? Uh, well, how do people feel about naked women or nakedness in general or writing on people's skin and so forth? So I thought, well, no, I will provide a service. I did a little YouTube video uh, about how to make a book cover. And, ba and we all know how, we all know this, but I thought for the youngsters who don't know how to do this, I would teach them. And I took a a grocery bag, a brown grocery bag, and and uh, made a cover uh, of the book. And then I said at the end of the video, and of course you can, like, just like in school, you can design your own book cover. You can draw on it, you can doodle on it, and make your own. So this is mine. Uh, I don't know if that improves. <laughs> And then I came up with this version, and I'm not sure that that's any better. It is the back side. So yeah, the Scheherazade by way of uh, Sixth Sense, by way of Tristram Shandy, and, and all that stuff. Well, what does that really mean? And, and what is this book about? Uh, it's about, it's a story of, an, of a young man 
who wakes up on the uh, bathroom floor at eight minutes to five in the morning. He's completely naked and he has a hole in the back of his head. And as he's sitting there on the floor, um, pondering what, what is that? He can't move. He's pondering what has happened to him. Uh, and all of a sudden, he hears someone out. He thinks he's, al he's alone in the house. He thinks he's alone in the house. He hears a cough. He's mortified about being uh, naked on the bathroom floor. He says, just as that mortification set in, a noise in the room alerted to me to another living presence, a little cough, not much more than the clearing of a throat, and a hem that changed everything. The existence of another soul in the room produced a strange sensation in my mind. I forgot about the wound, and all at once the bleeding stopped. I could open and shut my free eye, and feeling returned to my extremities. Conscious of the elastic restoration of the body, I sat up, perhaps too quickly. My skull ached worse than any hangover, so I pressed my head against the temples in order to steady myself. The cougher coughed again, this time from the vicinity of the bathtub. He sat on the porcelain edge, clad in a terry cloth bathrobe, a pair of sandals keeping his bare feet from direct contact with the red puddle on the floor. His posture ramrod straight, the old man stared right through me. His thin bare legs hung like two pipe cleaners beneath the blue hem at his knees. In his lap, he clasped his hands together like a supplicant or a holy aesthetic and when the next cough worked its way from his lungs to his mouth, he lifted one bony fist to his lips. Jutting out from the collar, the rope of his neck strained to hold up his long head, and his face looked austere like something from Giacometti, all severe angles and skin tight on bone, a hawk-like nose holding up round, rimless glasses, his eyes darkly colored of an uncertain hue, but expressing a relentless sense of blinkless surprise. Atop his skull, a shock of silver hair brushed carelessly straight up and back, which added to his startled and repose appearance, and his ears stuck out like handles on a ewer when he coughed small feathers, escaped from the corners of his mouth and through the lattice of clenched fingers yellow pin feathers wheeled in the air and began to float like ashes to the tiles. A wan smile creased the lower half of his ruined mug for an instant as if the cat apologized for swallowing the canary. His face was like one of those I carried in daily memory and I had known a younger version of it for many years. I could not be sure absolutely of his identity and if he was who I thought, his physical presence and existence through rational thought through the window, that his arrival did not surprise me can be attributed to the other startling events of the day, or perhaps he was not there at all, but rather some hallucination brought on by the concussion I had suffered the moment before. Because of the haze in my head, I put it as a question to the figure perched on the bathtub. Dad? He went into paroxysms again, that dry cough rattling up from his core, and he clamped his hand over his mouth. Tiny yellow feathers popped out of both ears. Excuse me, Sonny, but I have a powerful thirst. So our hero goes down to the kitchen to get him a nice noggin of whiskey, and on the way there, he has to pass by his bedroom. Sensing my belt, I moved ahead through a house as quiet as a grave. At the top of the stairs, I stopped and listened, and far away came a sigh from someone asleep. So delicate, it may not have been a sound at all, but only the thought or memory 
of a whisper from some other point in time and some space beyond the walls, or perhaps within the walls themselves. I could not tell whence it came, so I delayed my trip downstairs and sought its source. Another sloughing noise crept through the walls, and I dashed over to the spare room, threw open the door, and discovered them. The setting full moon cast a halo upon the bed. Some trick of the mind allowed me in that diffusion to see with vivid clarity the fumble of colors and patterns, a swirl of quilts and coverlets of the most outrageous hues and designs. But I had forgotten until that very moment the strange naked women hidden beneath the fabric. They appeared at once and all together a floating cloud flower and flesh, jumbling of limbs, hands, a bare breast, the curve of a hip, a half dozen bare arms, skin and hair of assorted hues, some be ribbon with garlands, others loose and unbound, lips, faces at odd, unnatural angles, eight women in a tangle, pretzeling bodies at rest, all but one of their faces were turned my way, one pair of eyes opened, Another blinked in my direction. The patterns on the bank blankets shimmered like colored glass in a kaleidoscope stirring to life. The colors moved like a wave. The blankets parted like the sea. Another woman cracked alert and stared at me, caressed the shoulder of her neighbor as if to wake her, and I stepped back from the threshold and quickly shut the door. Someone sighed again but I was not sure if this time it was not me. It's sort of, now, now that I read this again after all this time, it's sort of like a Fifty Shades of, no. I, I wish, right? Fifty Shades of Color. So, one by one, the women in the bed come into the bathroom to tell their stories. So there are eight women in the bed, you're gonna get eight stories, and each story is about how our hero done them wrong way back when. The first one comes in like this, comes into the bathroom, so the hero is back with the old man, and they've got, each got a glass of whiskey, and all of a sudden, they something alerts the old man. The thin man appeared to have ceased listening to my story just at the twist of the plot. Instead, he focused on a spot above my right shoulder, and at the same second, the light behind me changed ever so slightly and the room cooled by one degree. A presence had entered the bathroom, and my sixth sense tingled. As I swiveled my neck to see what lurked over my shoulder, the old man sprang to his feet and positioned me, himself between me and my attacker. Put down that club, he ordered, and the raised arm lowered the weapon in a slow and resigned arc. He stepped aside and revealed one of the girls from the bed. She had donned a yellow cotton shift that clung to her like butter on a corn cob, and her arms and legs shone like the color of strong tea. Her hair hung down in a black braid thick as a, the club she carried, and her eyes set in the dish of her face shone blacker still. The vision of her, perspiring slightly from her exertions and panting from the effort required by the heaving and lifting of the weapon, set my memory in motion. One of those faces to remember, married to a forgettable name. My name is C, she said, as if reading my mind. But she spoke in a language that lived on a shore distant from the center of my brain. Her exasperation she expressed in a frown, but fortunately, for everyone's sake, she switched over at once to English. 
but you may call me Dolly. A most unusual name in any language, the old man said. Kindly refrain from swinging about that cudgel of yours. Someone could get hurt. As long as a baseball bat, but much thicker at the business end, the war club was hewn from redwood, and on the protuberant bolus of the head, the maker had carved a stylized animal in the manner of the tribes native to the Pacific Northwest. The creature symbolized some manner of carnivore, judging from the rows of sharp triangles lining both sides of a curved mouth and the madness of the wide-set eyes. I could easily imagine the terror caused by such a face rushing to hammer down upon the forehead of its intended victim. One might die of fear before being felled. It was a humbling weapon designed for crushing blows from which little hope of recovery existed and the mere sight caused my head to ache again. Dolly modestly withdrew the club and hid it behind her skirt, taking care to keep her, keep her right hand firmly gripped around the tapered handle. My father, now by this time he thinks the old man is his father, my father relaxed and collapsed like a marionette on his seat at the edge of the bathtub. I studied Dolly's face in a vain attempt to match her becoming features with those stored in the hard drive of my head. And though the search resulted in zero matches, she seemed a long ago acquaintance, accidentally erased from the files. Her black eyes revealed nothing but my own image, and her lips were drawn in a hard, straight line. She did not smile or frown at my monkeyish attempts to elicit any reaction some sign that we were once intimates or friends. From his perch, the old man said, to what, may I ask, do we owe the pleasure of your delightful company? With her bare arm, she wiped the sweat from her brow and in that gesture released the scent of rain and cedars, of dried fish and a musky perfume that opened my all factory remembrance of a bygone time. The old man cocked his head so the words might flow more easily into the trumpet of his ear. You have a story for us. Do tell. So she tells her story. And then uh, each, of the, each of the women uh, tell their story. So I'm going to pause there, if that's a good pausing point, or I could read more. Uh, or I could take questions. How about I take questions? <laughs> Thanks for stepping up, Keith. Yes, <laughs> Miss um, Brown. So I was so fascinated by each of these eight women who are each such, they have such interesting stories. And I feel like they were all so genuine, yet they're all in different sort of different historical periods, right. all have different voices. How did you go about creating them and researching them and building them? Uh, how how did I create the the eight women in, who are in the bed and what because they each come from a different time in American history they're roughly about 70 years apart this first story Dolly tells is a Tlingit Indian legend from the uh, I want to say it's late 16th century it's called the woman who married a bear and she tells her story about the about how she married a bear and the consequences of that, which you might imagine are hardly ever good. Um, <laughs> then one by one, the women come through century by century, centuries of June, century by century, uh, to tell their story. Um, the next woman, see, I wrote this a long time ago. Uh, the next woman comes from the, uh, the wreck of the sea venture off the coast of uh, Bermuda. Uh, Shakespeare did The Tempest based on that same, very same shipwreck. Uh, and that's called, uh, I could look this up, it might be easier, The Woman Who Swallowed a Whale. And it's about a woman who swallows uh, part of a whale, let's say. <laughs> Give me, grant me a poetic license. And that's uh, in 1609. So. We progress through. There, there. Each of these stories comes, uh, and I basically I knew some of these stories going. I knew 
like you know stuff in your life. How did, where did you learn that? I don't know. I really don't know. Um, some of these stories seem to come from my own, the own mists of my childhood. Uh, others I had to do some research on. Uh, I've been to most of the places in the book. The first story takes place in the Pacific Northwest. Then there's a story in Bermuda, which I haven't been to, but I can imagine what it's like. Uh, one's in Salem for the Salem Witch Trials. One's in New Orleans uh, where uh, a woman who was a slave during the time when the French and Spanish were uh, taking over or trading New Orleans. Um, so for stories like those, you have to you do have to research. A lot of it is, uh, you know, books, other books, uh, certainly the web and things like that. But more important to me than those research questions, um, I'm not. I don't consider myself a historical an historical novelist, or I don't write historical novels, even though they're set in a certain time. Um, that's rather inconsequential to me. Uh, more important to me is is trying to distinguish each of these characters, and one of the ways that I cheated. Uh, this is these true writer confessions. One of the ways that I cheated was to change the style of each story. So the myth story is told a la an old myth. Um, then the woman who who uh, is shipwrecked leaves behind, um, you know, an account, like a journal account. Then the Salem witch trials are all based on various documents from the Salem witch trial archives. And the, there's a story in, set towards the end set in New York in the 1950s, and that's supposed to be like a film noir, uh, you know, riffing off that. So those things are kind of easy to do. I mean, they're kind of, once you understand what you're trying to do and go out and you grab the setting and time and style, but then you, then you have to try to make those characters live as distinct individuals and keep them, you know, when you're dealing with eight characters, eight stories, eight equivalent stories, you're sort of juggling a lot of balls and you've got to keep them separate in your mind and distinct in your mind. Some, some little tr other little tricks are they've got, all got different names. They're all wearing a different color dress, you know. And so it, helps, it helped me understand who was standing where and what were they doing during this particular scene. It all takes place in the bathroom of that, this house. So first you've got the guy, the hero of the book, then you've got the old man who coughs feathers. Then one by one, you've got each of the women. Then, my fir I, I'll tell you, my first two books had children as the protagonists. And I decided, you know, I, I, are any of my kids here? I'm sick of children. Um, and I won't, that will not have any children in this book. This is just adult, 50 shades of women, and so forth. And it'll be all adult. So I'm writing along, and I'm, you know, skillfully avoiding children. And I come to this, the woman who's telling the Salem witch trial story. Uh, if you know the Salem witch trial story, one of the ways that they proved they were witches is that they made dolls. Weird, isn't it? They made dolls, little poppets. Um, they're very plain dolls, and that was somehow proof that they were practicing sort of black magic on these dolls. So since we're in the bathroom, Alice, who is the woman telling the, the Salem witch trial story, as she's telling it, she grabs a washcloth and makes a doll because it's the bathroom, a washcloth doll, okay? And so all of a sudden I've got this doll in the bathroom and then another trick of the book is the guy, the hero has to get out of the bathroom and come back into the bathroom so that something can happen. Otherwise you don't have a novel. Um, <laughs> So I have him go out of the bathroom, and he comes back into the bathroom, and the washcloth 
has changed into a real baby. And so all of a sudden I've got this unexpected, unplanned for child to take care of for the rest of the book. Um, so then you start to have fun with it. I mean, you know, what else are you going to do once, once the baby's here? Um, you might as well enjoy it. Uh, so, so I have the baby age. Now all this book, this book takes place at 4.52 a.m. On, on a summer's night in June. The watch stops. We know that there's no, no time progresses during this thing. So that means that anything in the world can happen. Right? If the time is not going to change, then all, every other rule is broken. So I have the, uh, the little baby, who, washcloth baby, grow up. Every time the man leaves the bathroom and comes back in, the baby's older. Um, and at one point, if I can find this quickly. At one point in time, the, the narrator thinks that... Um, The narrator thinks that, that uh, the old man, first he thinks he's his father, then he starts to think he's Samuel Beckett because he looks like Samuel Beckett. Um, and so I had the real joy of having Samuel Beckett-like character, for me, the real joy, of having the Samuel Beckett-like character uh, play with the little baby. I like the little baby's just in love with Samuel Beckett, uh, the Samuel Beckett character, and and Samuel Beckett's in love with the little baby. So I, I get to write lines like you know, Samuel Beckett saying, "Would you like some more num num num?" and uh, <laughs> and the baby saying, "Certainly." Um, <laughs> Here's a, here's a part, I do have some time. Here's a part uh, with uh, when he starts to think that this guy's Beckett. It's later in the book. And ignore other characters' names. It's not important to you. It's hardly important to me. <laughs> Behind the glass of his spectacles, his bright eyes blinked back a film of moisture that could have been taken for the beginning of tears. His bottom lip quivered, then he, but then he composed himself. I was growing quite fond of the old bugger. He winked at the girls. What would you think of the, what did you think of the most recent one? He jerked his thumb in Marie's direction, took every ounce of concentration to keep reading the words on her skin and not give in to distraction. She is quite beautiful, really. Stunning. And that accent, a French woman would make the shopping list sound sultry. Must be all that red wine and cigarettes. In the bare light, he looked even more recognizable. Tall and thin as a scarecrow, swept back thatch of silver hair, the wired rim glasses, and a face etched with wrinkles earned from 10,000 jetons and night after night of staring down at a blank page. The famous French playwright. You remind me of someone. Your father. No, yes, him too, but someone else. I'm glad it was somebody else. I was getting concerned. What was the name of that French fellow who wrote that play, Waiting for Godot? He patted at the pockets of his robe. Reaching in with two fingers, he pulled out the wrinkled balloon and considered it as though it had been, as though he had no memory of the object. A thought tickled his lips. Do you have a cigarette? I don't smoke. Now would be an odd time to start then. <laughs> Still, it is a very famous play about nothing. Nothing? Everything is about something. Even this? Especially this. Even silence has meaning and countless interpretations. Yes, I said, agreeing simply to be sociable. It's about two tramps who are waiting for Godot to return. A French play? Sounds like a film I saw once with the poker-faced actor Buster Keaton. He had gotten into a number of jams and was awaiting the return of his partner to straighten things out. Man's name was Godot, but he never returns. 
Or perhaps it wasn't Keaton at all, but Laurel and Hardy. No. Waiting for Godot is a kind of existential comedy. But Laurel and Hardy would make a good Vladimir and Estragon, don't you think? Two tramps, Laurel and Hardy were always two tramps. I am beginning to feel like we're two tramps, waiting for some order out of this chaos. No, I'm sure it was Keaton. He was much admired by your playwright. He even used Keaton in a film without words, not a silent film, but nothing to be said. You even sound like him, I said. You're a Frenchman? Perhaps he only wrote in French, forced himself to think harder. That's it, I said. Beckett, an Irishman who wrote in French first and then translated his own words into English. God bless you, Mrs. Stottlemyre. Who? 11th grade in literature class, my teacher. <laughs> Mrs. Stottlemyre. Funny what we remember. So are you? Beckett? He raised his bushy eyebrows. I'm afraid Beckett is dead. Some time ago. Beckett's ghost, then. Did you not pinch yourself a while back there and conclude the evidence of your own corporality exists? Don't you trust your own senses? And if I were a mere ectoplasm, what does that make those young beauties over there? I can assure you, Sonny, they're as real as you and me. With flutter of fingers, he waved to the women. If you're not the ghost, and you're not a f my father, and not the Irish playwright Beckett, then who are you? You attempt to answer a positive, but advert to the negative. All in good time, bucko. First, there are several more women in your bed. And that's another thing I said. Why are they here? What are they implying with their stories? That I'd somehow I am to blame? The old man laid a fatherly hand upon my shoulder. You are overwrought, my boy. And yet, as I have said, as you've said, there are more women in the bed from whom we haven't yet heard. The very thought of those other creatures nearly drove me to tears. So I think I've got time for one question or two or with short answers. Yes? Can I speak about the use of fantastic elements in my fiction? Uh, I could speak at length about that, but I, and the short answer is I think all fiction is fantastic. I think that we're asked to believe Gatsby there on West Egg, and that's just inc as incredible as something I'm describing. Um, I'm not trying to you know, be facetious here. I do think that the reading experience, all bets are off. Um, and I'm perfectly happy to use this way of telling stories to dig into the human experience. And that, I mean, that, in the end, for all writers, fantastic or not, that's what this is all about. Yes? What am I working on now? I'm, I'm working on another book uh, that I refuse to talk about on the grounds that it may incriminate me. Okay. No, I'm not a poet. Well, thanks. I like poetry. I've read poetry. But poetry and I are not acquainted. Yes. I started out as a child, to quote Bill Cosby. Uh, yeah, I started telling, I, I started, uh, my first stories were when I was late for dinner as a child. And my parents would say, where, where have you been? What, why are you late? You know, you're, when your father's car is in the driveway, you're supposed to come home. And I was always looking somewhere else. I never saw the car. And the first couple of times they didn't like, they thought that's not sufficient. So then I lied. I made something up. I said something fantastical occurred, and I, that's consequently I'm late. Um, and they seemed to enjoy that. Uh, and so I kept doing it. And I had a, a wonderful seventh grade teacher, God bless anybody who's a teacher out there, who said, keep a journal, write whatever you want to write. Most of the kids wrote, you know, today we watch Dark Shadows. 
I made stuff up, you know, <laughs> and have been doing that ever since. Um, I wrote speeches professionally for a long time. And when I was 40, I decided to go back to my long-held dream of becoming a novelist. Sat down, wrote The Stolen Child. Thank you. <laughs> Didn't care about whether it would be... I, I mostly cared about could I do it? Could I actually do it? And when I did it, then I thought, well, maybe this is good enough to sell. I've read other books. And it took a couple of years to do, to sell. And uh, off we went after that. So... It's it's a long, strange journey. Okay, eleven forty. That's my that's my cue to exit stage left. Thank you very much.